if you've been going with us through the word, you've found that uh, Isaac, well, he has been uh, given sons, Jacob and Esau. But the problem is from the very beginning, even before they were born, they struggled within the womb of Rebecca. And uh, it's been a problem ever since. And we saw last week how uh, Jacob sort of purchased the birthright from uh, Esau by selling it for a bowl of stew. And then we saw how he uh, really tricked uh, old Esau into uh, um, giving up, you know, or not being able to take his blessing. The birthright and the blessing gone, Esau's got nothing. And so we uh, ended last week in chapter 27, verse 41, where it says that, um, uh, you know, after his father blessed uh, Jacob, Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. And now we see Jacob in big trouble. He's going to run for his life. Uh, Rebecca will not see Jacob for 43 years after this. She, she, in trying to bless her son and keep her son in, in her, uh, you know, proximity, she ends up messing it up. It's interesting how, um, you know, there's an old saying, striving to better, oft we mar what's well. And it's true, especially when you're striving to better something that God already says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work this out. I'm going to make this come, come to pass. And uh, the problem is, uh, Rebecca says, well, I'm going to help God along. By this time, hopefully you and I, we're starting to realize that's not a good idea. To say, oh, Lord, you need some of my help, I'll chip in. Not that we're to sit around and do nothing, but when it comes to God fulfilling his promises and God doing what he says he will do, for us to try to manipulate or finagle to try to make that happen, that always ends up in real uh, catastrophe. And we see that all throughout the scriptures. And so through trickery and through uh, his own, um, you know, ability to, to uh, be the surplanter, heel snatcher, following up with his name, Jacob, as we saw, he ends up with the birthright, with the blessing, but it's not such a blessing. <laughs> In fact, it's going to be a curse really to him for quite some time. And uh, we're going to pick this up tonight and see that the scriptures are true. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. So by Jacob sowing trickery and deceit, uh, that's going to be what he gets. And that's just a biblical truth, something for us to think about. Uh, the Bible is right on that one uh, all the time. So verse 1 of chapter 28, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, my mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham, uh, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. So we have here Isaac. Now you say, Brett, didn't Isaac already bless Jacob? Hasn't this already taken place? What are we doing here again? Why is, you know, Isaac reiterating? Well, there's a couple perhaps good reasons. One, uh, we see this promise of blessing to the promised seed of Abraham. We see that all the time. The Lord says it so many times in his word, you really should never doubt that God's uh, word is going to come to pass. He gives us over and over re reminder. But they say that repetition is the mother of all learning. <laughs> Do you think Jacob's got it yet? Do you think he's got down okay? I'm, I'm going to be blessed. Everything's going to work out. I don't think so. We're going to see that he doesn't actually get that yet. So we're going to hear it a few more times before maybe even tonight's over. But that's one reason. Another reason perhaps why uh, Isaac sees fit to again speak this again to, to Jacob is because Jacob received it the first time through deceit. Remember dressing up with hairy goat arms and wearing stinky Esau clothes and going in and tricking his father. Remember that whole thing? And so now Jacob's probably thinking, man, did the blessing really even work? I, I mean, I got it through trickery and deceit. 
But here Isaac is reiterating saying, it's still good. The promise still goes to you. This is also perhaps Isaac himself finally giving in and saying, okay, God, I'm gonna let you have your way the way you told me it was supposed to be from the beginning. But Isaac didn't want that. He loved Esau. Esau he loved and Jacob he knew as the smooth man that liked to cook with the ladies in the kitchen. Now, by the way, for those of you men that like to cook and are perhaps smooth, uh, good for you. Uh, some guys are like, I'm offended, Brett, that you think that's so funny. Uh, I, I think it's funny. But uh, if you're one of those guys, guess what? You win. Uh, Jacob's the smooth dude that likes to cook with the ladies in the kitchen, and, and, and he wins. The Lord is on his side. In fact, Romans chapter 9. If you're not familiar with it, you perhaps should at least know about it. I'll just read it to you. You, you. you can jot it down in your notes. It's definitely something to remember. It says this. In Romans chapter 9, verse 10, it says, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Now you say, well, yeah, what shall we say then? What do we have to say about that? Here's God saying the older is going to serve the younger. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And it's funny because to me, maybe a lot of you guys particularly, I don't know, would like Esau and you'd vote for Esau over Jacob. Because, you know, Esau's kind of the man's man. He's sort of, you know, out there hunting and doing good, cool guy stuff. Um, but God says, that's not the one I've elected. He's not the one that I've chosen. See, this gets into a big question of election, divine election, predestination, the foreknowledge of God. And people get all upset about this and freaked out and debate it. And it's worth debating. It is a, a, an interesting theme in the Bible to talk about. And you can talk about it all you want. I, I like, you know, there's examples and illustrations. H.A. Ironside had the, the model of the hallway that you walk through. And uh, you are invited into this room by a sign that says, all who wish may enter. And so you think, well, I'm going to choose to enter into this room. So you enter in and there's a, a big feast laid out and there's people in there and there's place settings. And man, there's food. You're like, oh, man, am I really invited here? And you walk up to the table and sure enough, there you see a place setting with your name plate on that place setting. And you're like, man, I've been invited. I've been chosen. But, but wait a minute, who, who chose? Did you choose to walk in that room? Yeah. But did somebody know you were already gonna be there? Mm-hmm. How'd they know that? Well, in God's case, God knows everything. But did God choose you or did you choose God? That's the big question. That's the one that everybody wrestles with. And the answer is yes. <laughs> Both. Um, how can that be, Brett? That doesn't work out. Well, here's the thing that doesn't work out is uh, the person that says, I, I am so much opposed to God choosing people and me not having any, any choice. Oh, you do have a choice. Yeah, but God really chooses. Yeah, but you really choose. See, and by the way, uh, it, it also gets into the whole Calvinist, Arminius argument about, you know, uh, God's sovereignty, divine election versus, you know, human responsibility. And it becomes this big, huge debate. But Romans chapter nine uses Jacob and Esau, the guys in our story, as sort of the thing that should at least shut our mouths. <laughs> How so? It says that Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. This is what God chose. This is the way he planned it. This is what God chose. But I would, I would argue also that Jacob chose his way and Esau chose his. And God chose, chose one over the other. And then rhetorically, Paul, when he writes to the Romans here, he says, you know, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? He says, God forbid. Let me read on. He says, for he said to Moses, I will have uh, mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For scripture saith, even Pharaoh was even for this purpose, have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, I will have, uh, he had mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will, he will harden. Remember how Pharaoh, the Lord says he hardened it, Pharaoh's heart. Uh, he didn't choose Pharaoh. He chose Pharaoh to be kind of the, the bad guy in the story. 
uh, for an example for people who have hardened hearts. It's interesting when you read the story in the book of Exodus about Pharaoh, nine times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But it says nine other times that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. I think that's funny. It's an equal number. Uh, so the people that debate, did Pharaoh choose or did God choose Pharaoh? Uh, and the answer is, is both. God, Pharaoh chose to harden his heart and God hardened his heart. It happened all together. And then it finishes up here in Romans. He says, God will have mercy on who will have mercy. And he says, nay, but oh man, who are you that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed, that's us, say to him that formed it, that's God, uh, why, hast you, why hast thou made me thus? It's King Jimmy for, why'd you make me like this? Uh, and then he finishes, he says, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another to dishonor? Now, some of you might be saying, Brett, that's all fine and dandy for your little theology discussion. God chose me before the foundation of the world, predestination, divine election, all that stuff. But I'm still really uncomfortable with that. Well, I can understand. And some people say, oh, I don't want to reply against God because Paul's right. Who am I, you know, to, to say anything against God? But it makes me really nervous, some people say. I'm really afraid because the potter can make a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. He's the potter, we're the clay, and God can make out of us whatever he wants. What if he makes me into a toilet? That's a vessel. Or a spittoon. That's a vessel. And there's a bunch of wine glasses and some beautiful pottery and stuff, and I'm the toilet bowl. What if that happens? Here's the thing that you got to remember. A couple real easy things. And, and call me a simpleton if you want, but I think it's super easy. First of all, if you're wondering what kind of vessel God's making... Uh, that's really up to God. He's sovereign. But the Bible does imply that you have human responsibility to believe, to follow, to do what you can to walk with the Lord and do his will. It's a get to. We get to just do the best we can. And you know what's amazing is you'll see then, instead of wondering, did God make me a toilet bowl or a wine glass? Which one? Then the answer is be as much of a wine glass as you can, or at least be the most shiny toilet you possibly can be. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, just do your best and go with the rest and trust that the Lord is good. That's number one. Number two, and finally, um, you know, when you look at the potter who's shaping the vessel and you're all upset, thinking, who is God that he made me the way I am with my idiosyncrasies or dysfunctions or personality traits? Or I remember when I was a kid, I had, you know, until my hair went gray, I had really curly hair. And ladies would walk up to me as a little kid, like, you know, picture yourself being a nine-year-old kid and ladies going, oh, I love your hair. I wish I had your hair. I'm just like, oh, I hate curly hair. And uh, I was so thankful when it went gray. Be careful what you ask for, by the way, because uh, when it went gray, it kind of went more straight, you know. Uh, but, uh, but I used to think, oh, I remember my buddy Brian had this straight hair that flopped around, you know, and he had long, straight hair. I was like, that's what I want. God, why did you make me with curly hair? And rosy cheeks. People say, Brett, why do you have such red cheeks? And I'd say, my mom, well, she dropped me out of the car and I hit the pavement and skinned my cheeks up. And they're like, really? No, not really. <laughs> I hated those things. You know, there's certain characters. Lord, why did you make me this way? And, and, and here's the thing. God can make you however he wants to make you. But here's the thing. When you look at the potter's hand that's pressing in and squishing the clay, which sometimes hurts and life is so daily, it just spins around and around the potter, all that stuff. The good news is when you look closely at the hand that's applying the pressure, there's little nail print scars in those very hands. The, the one who died on the cross for my sins is the same one who's shaping my life. The one that loved me so much that he died for my sins uh, in my place. Is that someone I can put my trust in? I'm just going to choose to trust the hand of the potter that's shaping my life. However it is, whatever things you have that everybody else doesn't have or vice versa, and you're just struggling with life, just, just say, you know what, Lord, you're a good God, and I'm going to put my trust in you. So don't freak out. But Brett, if, what if I'm not chosen? What if I'm not chosen even to be a believer, to know Jesus, to walk with the Lord? We can find out tonight. If you want to become a Christian, you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, that God raised him up from the dead. You believe that, you confess that, and it says you will be saved. And then you can know, hmm, God chose me before the foundation. Of the, I'm a divinely elected person from God. Uh, Brett, have I loved? 
And there's other people that maybe, well, does God hate people? This is one of those things when your kids ask you, does God hate anybody? You have to say yes. God doesn't hate. No, it says right there, Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. The end. Well, who is God? Don't reply against God. Just hope you're on the Jacob side. Amen? Amen. Well, all that to say, it's a little hard for some people, but I, I'm so thankful by the grace of God I'm chosen. I don't deserve that. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't done anything to really uh, re- get that reward, but God has chosen me. And that's a blessing. That's huge. So this idea of uh, Jacob being chosen, oh, that's what we're seeing right here. So uh, that's the first thing we see here. Uh, Also in chapter 28, verse one, it says that uh, Jacob was charged by Isaac. He said, take thou not a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Now, this is something we've been kind of talking about recently because we see in the Bible that God is not into mixture. Now, don't get this wrong. Some people will talk about interracial marriage and say that it's not biblical because of this. And I don't see that scripturally at all. But it's the idea of being unequally yoked. Uh, the idea of spiritually being linked to somebody who's on a totally different page than you spiritually. And so Isaac's again saying, Jacob, do not do what your brother Esau did. Remember, he married a couple Hittite hotties. We learned that last week. And it caused his mother and his father great grief. They were Canaanites, really. And so he says, Jacob, you're the promised seed. You're the one that the Messiah is going to come through. You're the one that God's going to bless. And so make sure that you marry someone who's not going to pull you away from the true and living God. And uh, boy, moms and dads, make sure and instill this within your kids early, that that they need to find a husband or a wife who is uh, of the same faith go on the same direction. I believe there's this unequally yoking thing that we talk about and, and uh, people say, well, as long as he's got a pulse and he's a Christian, he's gonna be good. I think being equally yoked is even more than just, are you saved? Um, and, and by the way, the idea of being equally or unequally yoked, it's not just in marriage. In fact, when you read 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 14, he, the context is not even really talking about marriage. Did you know that? It says in first, uh, pardon me, Second Corinthians chapter six, verse fourteen. It says, "Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness?" Um, by the way, uh, so the context of this is the Corinthian church. They were very much being uh, raised and brought up as a church, but they were living in the midst of Hellenism. Do you know what Hellenism was? Uh, You know, you might think of big pillars with the cornices and all the architecture that was Hellenistic uh, architecture, which is pretty fascinating. But that's true. There's Hellenistic artwork where there's also uh, architecture, but there's also Hellenistic attitudes and worldviews. And uh, the Hellenist was a Greek worldview that was very godless, very pagan, and very much materialistic and pretty, pretty much lost. So when Paul was writing the Corinthian church there in 2 Corinthians, when he says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, um, it's not just in marriage, that too, but in life. Uh, You don't want to perhaps go into business and sign contracts, uh, business partners uh, with an unbeliever and a believer, because your values are going to be different. It's not that the believer is less than you, or you're better than they are, or you're smarter than they are. That's not the point. The point is, when you're linked to an unbeliever, are they going to take you where you don't want to go in business or in marriage or even in certain friendships? Now, what's interesting, Jesus was called the friend of sinners. Isn't that interesting that Jesus was the friend of sinners, but it says, don't be unequally yoked? But here's the thing. Jesus was the friend of sinners, as should we be. I hope you have some good sinner friends. I hope you're, uh, you're there and at work and people who you know that aren't Christians. I hope you're not the Christian that is so isolated that uh, all the worldly people just don't want anything to do with you. I see Christians that sort of do that. Jesus was the friend of sinners. Here's the big difference. Jesus never uh, was dragged into sin by being linked to sinners. It was quite the other way around. All the sinners, they hung out with Jesus and they started to change their own lives and they started to be very different. Um, And uh, Jesus was the hammer, they were the nail. You're either the hammer or the nail, the one who influences, the one who's influenced. I hope you're the hammer. Uh, Not that you're pounding people, that's not the point. 
but that you're the one who's kind of driving the, the boat, sort of, uh, you know, and, and that's what Jesus did. So he was the friend of sinners, but he never signed contracts with sinners, never went into business with sinners, never married a sinner uh, who was unsaved, unforgiven. When I say sinner, we're all sinners. The difference is, have you uh, been saved? Uh, hopefully you're equally yoked. Uh, many of you in this room can probably say, yep, I yoked myself in business with an unbeliever and it was not a cool deal. Uh, that happens often, uh, sad to say. So really the idea of mixture is gonna be all throughout the Old Testament. We're gonna see tons of scriptures where God's saying, come ye out from among them, be ye separate, don't intermix. We're gonna read the story of Balaam, remember Balaam and his donkey? He went to go curse the children of Israel. We're gonna see this in the book of Numbers. But he, every time he went to curse the children of Israel, only blessing came out of his mouth. And the king's like, I hired you to curse them, but I can't. I'm only saying blessing. I can't say anything mean. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have? I'm going to curse you, you bless you, and may the Lord shine his grace. And oh, that was Balaam. Well, finally, Balaam tried to outsmart God. He says, okay, I, I can't curse them, but here's what you do. You get them to uh, a bunch of those Midianite women who are really good looking, you get them all gussied up, put makeup on, fancy dresses, and you send them down to those Israeli boys and they'll fall in love. But make sure when they come, bring their little idols and their little gods. And then when those guys marry, they'll intermix with the idolatry of the Midianites and it'll mess up the Jews. And sad to say, Balaam was absolutely right. And that's exactly what happened. They started to intermarry, started to worship other idols because their wives brought in these idols and they didn't keep themselves separate. So this idea of being unequally yoked, that's what Jacob is hearing from his dad. Don't go down to Canaan to get a wife. Go to our land where our family is from, Pan, uh, Pan, Pandanaram. Well, verse 6, when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pandanaram and uh, to take a wife from thence, and that uh, as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, thou shalt not take a wife unto the daughters of Canaan. And Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau to Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, uh, to be his wife. Uh, and Jacob then went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So Esau now has uh, four wives, as I'm counting, uh, and, uh, J and Jacob's got none. And again, I need to say this just because if you're new here, I don't want to get you freaked out, but you'll see polygamy in the Bible. And uh, some people who don't know how to interpret the Bible, they say, well, because polygamy's in the Bible, God condones it. Uh, that's ridiculous. There's all kinds of things in the Bible that God does not condone. God does not condone slavery. Slavery is in the Bible. God does not condone polygamy. And, uh, but, but what God does, uh, you'll see in some of these things, he'll seek to regulate slavery, regulate uh, polygamy to where hopefully humanity would get to a place where they would uh, phase it out and get rid of it. Uh, I love the, the plan that God made for uh, slavery. He said, if you have a slave, you can only have them for seven years. Then you got to let them go unless... You say, but Brett, what if they treat him horribly for seven years? Uh, that's not mercy of God. Well, no, unless you treat your slave really well and that slave after seven years has become part of the family. Uh, then he becomes a doulos in the Greek. Uh, that is a bond slave where he chooses to continue to serve in that house because he loves serving in that house. Then he can become a bond slave, a willing slave, um, which Paul calls himself. He says, I am a bond slave, a doulos Willing slave of Jesus Christ. That's what he calls himself. So it's kind of an interesting picture how God seeks to regulate slavery. And you can quite easily show in the Bible that slavery is not cool at all. Uh, nor is polygamy. So that's something to think about. Um, so Esau is doing this thing. He's got multiple wives. Now Jacob's headed off to Haran. And verse 11, he lighted upon a certain place where he tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them down for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep. We uh, saw on Sunday that a good conscience, conscience makes for a soft pillow. 
Um, and here he is with rocks. So does he have a good conscience? Probably not. He's uh, actually struggling because he knows that he sinned and that he was manipulative and he's in trouble and he's running from Esau. So he lays down to sleep, verse 12, and he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on earth and on the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Quiz time. Who is this ladder? Jesus, good. It's always the right answer, isn't it? Jesus, that's what kids say in Sunday school. Um, uh, John 1 51 is that scripture that we saw that on Sunday, that this ladder is a picture of a type of Jesus, uh, which should help us understand that the access to heaven where the angels are ascending and descending in his dream, Jesus would later talk about this, how this is him. He is the access to heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And uh, he uses this Old Testament story to sort of illustrate that. So he sees this dream, angels ascending and descending on this ladder or stairway. And verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. And the land uh, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Uh, Interesting, this very land where he's sleeping is the very land that's being bombed tonight. Um, uh, the, The Palestinians claim that the Gaza Strip is theirs and they claim that all of Israel is theirs. And so uh, if you saw the, the news, there's an escalation even today, this uh, Wednesday, um, uh, 70 rockets were fired from Gaza Strip, uh, the Hamas, uh, 70 rockets uh, flew over the border into Israel today. Um, the Israeli jets around 10 p.m. Wednesday night, you say, bro, it's not even time, time change, remember, uh, the different time zone. Uh, but at 10 o'clock Wednesday night, Israel uh, targeted uh, 29 targets uh, in Gaza with, uh, after the rocket attack where they uh, blew up Islamic Jihad bases that were targeted there. State Department called the heavy barrage uh, from Gaza Strip reprehensible. Israel, they said Israel has the right to defend herself. It's interesting to me that a lot of the world says Israel does not have a right to bomb those places. But man, what would happen if Canada started lobbing big rockets, 70 rockets into Montana? or Washington state, what do you think the United States would do? Would we go, now be careful, go to the peace table and talk, or would we blow them up? Uh, I'm pretty sure I know what we do as a nation, and uh, we should defend ourselves. It's amazing to me that the world, like if you go to the UN, how they talk about Israel should show restraint. How do you show restraint when 70 rockets in one day are flying over the border and landing in people's neighborhoods and houses? Um, That's just wrong. And uh, there's this crazy um, sort of mentality that the world has. But uh, interesting, here in the Bible, Jacob, who's the father of Israel, is promised by God again, repetition, again promised this land goes to the Jews. But even to this day, that land is in contention and the people say the Jews should not be there, but they are. Why are the Jews there? By the way, are the Jews good? No, they're just like us. They're sinners. In fact, most Jews in that region are atheists. Um, And do the Jews always do the right thing in their military practice? No. But the fact is, the reason the Jews are there, according to the Bible, if you're a Bible believer, it's because God says, I will gather my people back into the land in the last days. Uh, That's one of the major miracles of prophecy that the Bible speaks of. And the Jews have gathered And what's more, even though they're smaller than the state of New Jersey, they're one of the biggest world powers on the globe. That's a promise that God said that would happen. And and then that the world would try to take Jerusalem away, divide Jerusalem in half. Read Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14. God says they will try to divide Jerusalem in half. Our president just said a couple years ago, we'd like to divide Jerusalem in half. And we'd like, when he said that, he said, we'd like to return to the 1967 Uh, borders in Israel. If you do that, half of Jerusalem goes back to the Palestinians or to the uh, Arabs, uh, the Jordanians even. So it's kind of an interesting thing to watch uh, what was written thousands of years ago in the Bible coming to pass 
with perfection. Pretty incredible, really. But that's just news. We're reading about the Gaza Strip right now. This is where Jacob's hanging out, this place by Bethel. Uh, and down in that region where he was, down in uh, Pandan and Aram and all that, he's in that place. And so God says, this is the place you get to have. Well, verse 16, Jacob awoke out of his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. Are you in the place of the rocky pillow? Are you sleeping with a rocky pillow? Uh, are you in the place of Haran? Haran means confined, enclosed, boxed in. Are you in that place in life? Jacob thought he was alone, but the Lord finally revealed to him that I'm with you and I'm gonna get you through this season. And if you feel alone and like you're totally boxed in and confined in your situation right now, I can tell you, if you're a believer and if you're one who puts your trust in the Lord, the Lord says, I will be with you and I'll never leave you. And so finally he realizes, man, sure the Lord is in this place, but I didn't know it. Verse 17, and he was afraid uh, and said, how dreadful is this place? <laughs> this, this is none other but the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. So when he says it's dreadful and terrible, uh, it's old King James language of basically, this is an awesome, amazing place. It's not that he's totally freaked out as much as, and he is, but it's more that it's a glorious kind of thing. Uh, he's not just totally terrified. That, that's kind of hard to see in the translation there. So verse 18, we're gonna see Jacob show stuff. Now, now show what? What's he gonna show? Well, I, I believe Jacob is gonna show himself to be right now, for perhaps the first time, we're gonna see him be a believer. You say a believer? Well, in the Old Testament, we don't call them Christians, right? Because Christ hadn't been born and died on the cross yet. Uh, and remember, it was Abraham who, what was it that counted unto him for righteousness? He believed God and it counted him for righteousness. He believed God. It's not that he believed in God, because that's, that's, that's kind of an important thing to note. Do you know that Satan believes in God, but it says he believed God. That's, that's what's required of us, uh, to believe God. And it was counted unto uh, Abraham for righteousness. Same thing is true today. We believe God, his plan that he said that he would send his son to die on the cross for the sins of the world. If we believe God in that promise, then guess what? We're saved. So is Jacob at this point a believer? I think so, and I'll show you why. Three things. Number one, we see it in his worship. Uh, verse 18, Jacob rose up early in the morning, took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and set it um, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. But the name of that place, uh, that city was first called Luz, Luz. Um, so uh, interesting, he, he sets up this rock and pours oil. Oil in the Old Testament uh, and new is a type of the Holy Spirit, uh, speaking of God's power and his presence. And so I believe by setting up that rock, it's almost like setting up an altar, a place where he was gonna worship God. That's what he's doing here. So we see that there's evidence that he was a believer at this time because of his worship. But number two, not only his worship, but also his work. Um, it says in verse 20, Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and uh, will keep me in his way that I go, that and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Um, and so it says, verse 22, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, um, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Here's Jacob saying, okay, the Lord's gonna provide for me if that's gonna happen, which I think he's saying it is. He's asking more rhetorically, not like, I sure hope God does it, as much as he's saying, if you're gonna do this, then Lord, I'm gonna give you a 10th back of all that I take in. And that's the word tithe. The word tithe means 10th. Um, and so uh, some people say, well, that's an Old Testament notion. But Jesus said uh, that when, he, when you do your tithes, don't be like the hypocrites. And he and, um, talked about those guys, but he said, don't forget to do the other. That is to tithe, that is to the giving. So if you're a Christian, uh, then uh, I believe one of the things we get to do is give of the tithe. This is evidence of his work, uh, giving to the Lord a tenth of all that he had, just like his grandfather, Abraham, who gave a tithe to Melchizedek. It's a long story. We looked at it a few months ago. Um, so we see that. Number three, not only do we see it in his worship, in his work, but also in his walk. 
Uh, verse 1 of chapter 29, it says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And behold, um, he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and the great stone was upon the well's mouth. Now, here he is uh, nearing Laban's house, house in Padanaram. And he comes to this well. But before we do that, this is, there's an interesting thing that we miss in the English translation. This is where uh, maybe a little more of an in-depth study of the language is kind of rewarding, where it says in verse one, then Jacob went on his uh, journey. Um, th there's kind of an interesting implication in the Hebrew. In fact, some of your margins might even say, they lifted up his feet. Um, you say, well, okay, he lifted up his feet. But the idea is he had a pep in his step. <clears throat> he, he actually had a spring in his step. That's an idiom that we would use. Uh, man, he's got a spring in his step. What does that mean? <clears throat> it means he's kind of moving and happily just going along and going. That's the idea here. He's got happy feet. Uh, in fact, uh, that was before the movie. Uh, Jacob had happy feet. If you look at the literal Hebrew, that's what it kind of means, is happy feet. Um, and that's his walk. We see his walk. He's now deciding to get up and go where God wants him to be. Isaac told him to go there, and now he's going. And what's he find? He finds a well with some shepherds, some flocks, but there's a rock over the well. Verse 3. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and so they rolled the stone away from the well's mouth and watered the sheep, put the stone again in the place of the well's mouth in its place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know. Now, you say, Brett, my Bible says we know him, but you notice the word him is in italics? <laughs> That's because that word's not there in the original. It's like trying to make it. I wonder, I just wonder if they're like, we know. No, do you know him? Yes, we know him, but we also just know. <laughs> know what? Uncle Laban, man, he's the guy that's the trickster, the liar, the finagler himself. Jacob is about to meet his match when it comes to trickery and deception and uh, all that stuff. And so these guys are like, yeah, we know Laban. Uh, remember Uncle Rico, that's who you think of. Uh, when you think of Laban, think of Uncle Rico. And so uh, Jacob says, do you know him? And they said, we know. Verse six, and he said unto them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And he said, lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. And they said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the well's mouth and then we'll water the sheep. This is interesting to me. Jacob starts giving out orders. Did you notice that? He's like, come on, you guys, get off your duff, put the rock off and start watering your sheep. Oh, we can't, we don't have all the flocks here yet. When they all come, then we'll take the... And, and he sees Rachel um, uh, coming, the daughter of Laban, and uh, what's he doing? He's, I, I wonder if he sees this Rachel coming and we're gonna find out she's very pretty. And uh, Jacob kind of stands up and sort of showing who's boss. I think this is kind of cool. Uh, this is Mr. Smooth, Mr. Martha Stewart, kind of being a man here. He's being like, yeah, what are you guys doing? Take the stone off the, the well. And the guy says, we can't do it because our flocks are not all here. Well, then what happens? Verse nine. It says, while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, this, uh, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Now pause for a second. Isn't he doing great? <laughs> Man, da, 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 da. you guys should take the stone off. It takes, they said it takes a bunch of men. The men take the men and they, they, they take the rock and they take it off and it's kind of, you know, that's what we do. But they wouldn't do it. But he saw Rachel come. He's like, what do we do? Dun, 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 dun. He pulls the stone off the well. Uh, that's my $6 million man sound uh, for you old people. Um, so as he takes the stone off, um, then uh, Rachel comes, man, he's like flexing his muscles. He's doing kind of good. I'm, I'm proud of him. He's doing good. And, and he, he sees her. He's in love with her. And, and it says in verse 11, and Jacob kissed Rachel. Oh, this is great. What a man. And he lifted up his voice and then wept. 
Oh no, he was doing so good. Oh, he just starts crying. Okay, we, we got Martha Stewart back here. Um, <laughs> no, I just find this funny. So, um, so he kisses Rachel. Man, he's getting busy. Uh, he doesn't waste any time. So verse 12, Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother. Now, some of you might say, that's wrong. He's technically the nephew. Uh, but one thing you got to understand about the Bible is oftentimes... Um, in the, in the Bible, the, the term brother will refer to anybody who's a, a family member. Uh, I am your brother, uh, even though they, you could be your, your uncle, your nephew. In fact, um, uh, sometimes the Bible calls sons uh, or grandsons sons uh, because the way they use the term, these are my sons. And a grandfather could say, these are my sons. They say grandsons and great-grandsons included. So it causes some confusion, uh, but it shouldn't. It's just the old way of saying things. Uh, we're more specific in modern times. He will, wasn't he technically the nephew? Yes, but don't be freaked out by that. It's not a problem. That's the way they spoke in those days. I'm your brother. I'm your father's brother. Um, uh, and, he wa- uh, and that he was Rachel's, uh, pardon me, Rebecca's son, and she ran and told her father. So verse 13, it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob's sister's son that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. Now pause, why do you think Laban's such a hurry? Why does he run out? Does he just love this guy? Or does, yeah, yeah, ka-ching, that's right. Uh, uh, this guy Laban, he's into, the, he's into money and stuff like that. He's a greedy little dude. And uh, he's a godless dude. We're gonna find out that he worships false gods and he has idols. We're going to find that out later. But he's not doing this because he just loves uh, Jacob. We're going to see that. He's going to trick Jacob. He's going to do mean things to Jacob. Uh, But he runs out here and he remembers that when Isaac came, remember the story when Isaac came, he came bringing gold and silver and wealth. And so he's thinking, man, what's in this for me? And that's what he's doing. Verse 14, and Laban said unto him, surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. So he's hanging out for a month. Uh, What was he doing? We don't know. We don't know what he was doing for that month. But I think he was sitting around enjoying and getting to know Rachel. Um, That's, I think, was he working? Don't think so. I think he was just hanging out, uh, getting to know Rachel. Well, why do you know that? Well, we see Tricky Laban seeing Jacob start to hang around and maybe wearing out his welcome. He's been there for a month. He's like, man, this kid doesn't do any work possibly, because could it be in verse 15, we see Laban sort of manipulating now? It says in verse 15, and Laban said unto Jacob, because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for nothing? Hint, hint. I think he's saying you you should serve me, but not for uh, nothing. Tell me what shall thy wages be? Work for me instead of just hanging out mooching off of me. Maybe, Maybe that's what's going on. I don't know. There's an implication there. You can sort that out if you want, but What are you going to wage is going to be? And so verse 16, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Verse 17, and Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and (laughs) well-favored. Now, speaking of vessels, one to honor and one to dishonor, one that's a beautiful vessel and one that's a spittoon, this is basically saying that Rachel... She's the beautiful vessel. And Leah, she's, bless her heart, the the spittoon. Uh, When it says in King James, tender-eyed or weak-eyed, some of the translations, um, the idea is it's a hard thing because we don't have the same words that they used in in, uh, the Hebrew. But it basically means that Leah made your eyes hurt. (laughs) That she was was an ugly woman. That's really sad, isn't it? Um, But is it? You know, one of the things you and I should know, and this is a big one, and the the sooner we learn this, the better off we'll be, is, you know, I really do believe that when all is said and done, and when we stand before the Lord someday, that nobody will reply against God and say, why did you make me ugly? Or why did you make me poor? Or why did you make me this, that, other thing? In fact, What we will say according to the Bible is every knee will bow and tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and we will all declare righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Paul told the Corinthians that there's um, 
that there's no temptation that is, uh, you know, going to come against you that everybody else hasn't felt. In other words, it all kind of comes out in the wash is the idea. And I think when it's all said and done, you might think you got the bad end of the deal. Um, but, but really, the Bible kind of says it all comes out in the end somehow, some way. It's gonna, the Lord works it all out. We're going to kind of see that with Leah. Leah, who made your eyes hurt. But Rachel, who's all beautiful. Were you the sister that was not quite as beautiful as the other? Uh, or, or the uh, athlete that never could quite jump as high or leap as far or run as fast? And you're like, Lord, why did you make me like this? Uh, the Lord just made you like that, but don't worry. It's all going to come out in the wash somehow, some way. You know, I think of um, this and how righteous the Lord, you know, when we get to heaven, I think there's going to be some people that are going to be in heaven just with great reward and great mansions. And, it, it, you know, to whom much is given, much is required, the Bible says. That makes me a little nervous. I'll tell you why, because I've been given a ton. We all have. If you live in Portland, Oregon, and you live in a house and drive a car, you, you, you have been given much. To whom much is given, much is required. So the opposite might be true. Uh, to whom little is given, little will be required. I think you can also assume that. I wonder if when we get to heaven, you know, um, it's, it's tragic to me because in our culture, if somebody measures the baby's head size in the womb with their ultrasound equipment, and the baby's head size seems to be a little larger than normal, what do they tell you? Anybody? They, they tell you, uh, you should think about getting an abortion. That's what they tell you. Um, I know that for a fact. Been there, done that. Talk to people uh, who've had that happen. In fact, <laughs> what's amazing is how many people, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, I wish I could, but how many people have been told, you're going to have a Downs baby. You will have a Downs baby. Uh, they told that of one of our children. Uh, they looked at us like, oh, so what are you going to do about that? And uh, I think they could tell from my red face and hot demeanor that they shouldn't proceed with that conversation. Um, you know, the people who have Downs babies, by the way, are some of the most amazing families. And like you see the coolest kids and, you know, the parents that have this deep love that's just amazing to see of their Downs children. You know, it's so twisted the way the world looks at all that. But I have a hunch. I'm just using Downs as one example of many that I could use. But of, of people that are going to get to heaven who are going to have huge reward. Giant. They'll be right up there with Billy Graham, right at the throne of God. What did they do? Well, you were given a lot. And they were given a, quite a bit less. But it's all going to come out in the wash righteous and true are your judgments. Nobody's going to be able to say to God, that was not fair. That's what's, that's what's the truth. Well, so before we get all bummed out for Leah, we're actually going to see some of that come out even in her lifetime. Uh, so she's, uh, poor, poor Leah, she made your eyes hurt while Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Verse 18, but Jacob, it says, he loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee, Uncle Laban, seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give uh, her to thee than that I should give her to another man. You're better than most guys, so I guess I'll give her to you. So abide with me. Uh, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had to her. Isn't that great? That's romantic. They seemed but a few days, uh, these seven years. Um, would you mark down uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13? And that's known as what chapter? The love chapter. One of the characteristics of love that are defined by Paul there in a beautiful chapter descript description of love is love is patient. Man, you young single people, remember that. Or old single people, remember that. Love is patient. Um, I've never seen a couple regret waiting and being careful than to hurry things up. And perhaps the biggest thing that hurries, you know, a believing couple, Christian couple are saying, man, we want to be pure. We're not going to have sex before marriage. We're going to do it the godly biblical way. The world laughs at that, but whatever, God's right on this one. And so we have some really cool young single couples that are saying, we're not going to mess around. We're going to, we're going to be careful sexually before we get married. 
Now, statistics show us that people who abstain before they're marriage, uh, married, they have better sex life while they're married. And it's just better. God's way is better. And the world sits there and tells kids, oh, get condoms. Kids are just going to do it anyway. Uh, we've messed that whole thing up. I would argue, just look at the statistics on the whole thing. It's, it's pretty profound. But here's the problem. If you're a couple who's young and you're saying, we love each other and we're abstaining, there's sort of a pressure. Uh, now, by the way, uh, sexual temptation, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it, I think it's kind of a good thing in one sense that hopefully if you really are going to get married someday, hopefully that's something that you really are tempted by. I have met couples, I'm not even tempted at all, but we're going to get married. I'm like, Really? Should you be getting married? <laughs> it's the same thing when couples say, we live together. And, and I say, but, but, you know, the Bible says that that's kind of not really the way, the, the order of things. The Bible kind of teaches that you're supposed to get married, then you move in together. Uh, I know the world doesn't believe that, but that, if you want to follow the Bible, that's what you do. Oh, but we don't have sex. We just, we live in separate bedrooms and we live in the same house. And then my comment is this, really? You're able to abstain and be alone in the house together at the same time? You don't love each other enough. You, you don't have enough passion. Uh, I don't, because man, you sh that should be impossible for you. And if it's not impossible for you, you need to find someone who that would be impossible for you for. <laughs> I really believe that. Uh, I believe sexuality in marriage is super important and it should be a temptation. That's why, um, you know, for you dating couples, you, man, it's important to be above reproach, abstain from even the appearance of evil. You know, there was a point where when Deb and I started getting serious when we were dating, we started going on double dates. We didn't hang out at my apartment at all, uh, my duplex where I lived there in Jacksonville. We didn't go there. We, we would hang out at my parents' house or go out with friends. And uh, we did that not because we were uh, um, self-righteous prudes. We were just smart, just being smart. So um, the reason I bring all that out is uh, if sex is what's driving the urgent date for getting married, um, there are other ways to deal with that. Um, and I would say it's better to wrestle with that one and be abstaining from the appearance of evil and all that stuff, but don't pull the trigger until you know that you know. Love is patient. And we see that modeled here by Jacob who worked seven years and I'll tell you, the days seem, the years seem like days, even as the Lord will take care of you as well as a couple. Well, verse 21, it says, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. Now, this is pretty, this is kind of crude. When you read it in the Hebrew, it says it like this, basically. It says, Jacob says, Give me my wife now. I want to have intimacy and uh, hot passion with her now. <laughs> That's how it says it in the Hebrew. <laughs> so Laban gathered together all the men of that place and made a feast. <laughs> and it came, into, it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, the one that made your eyes hurt, remember her? Took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and, they, and he went in unto her. That's the Bible way of saying they had sexual intimacy. How could that be, Brett? I don't get it, man. Couldn't he tell that she was Leah if she was that ugly? Well, you gotta understand, in Bible times, uh, they would heavily veil the bride. She was basically like a pile of, pile of uh, cloth and tool or whatever. Uh, you know, and they're like, are you sure that's the one? Uh, Trust me, Uncle Laban says. And so they go into the darkness of the room and then she's unveiled, but he doesn't see really who she is. That's probably what happens here. Now I do need to say, this is Leah going along with Uncle Laban's trick. Uh, sometimes Leah goes off without any... Uh, notice of that. But I think that Leah could have very easily said, by the way, I'm not Rachel. Um, but she doesn't. And so they have intimacy. And by the way, here's another Bible thing. Once the couple has sexual intimacy, they're considered married. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That, it wasn't a signing of a document or going before the justice owe the peace or the county clerk. It was actually the sexual act that said, now you're married, congratulations. Um, it's a little different than our day. But that's the way it was back then. And so uh, he goes in and has intimacy with Leah. And uh, verse 24, and Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his uh, maid for a handmaid. That was kind of custom that the daughter gets a handmaid. Often the handmaid would become a concubine of the husband. We'll see that in a second. Verse 25, and it came to pass in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And 
Jacob said to Laban, ah! No, he didn't say that. I'm sorry. I, I just made that up. Uh, he said to Laban, what is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me or, or deceived me? Um, this is again, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He's being deceived by Uncle Laban, even as he deceived his own father. Verse 26, and Laban said, it must not be done, uh, so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. I wonder if Uncle Laban just made that rule up right there on his top of his head. Um, but he says, verse 27, fulfill her week and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. Now this is an interesting verse because of a couple things. One, it uses a word that uh, is very hard for us in the English. The, the Hebrew word is heptad. And the he word heptad is, it means seven. Uh, but it means seven whatever. See, when we use the word week, uh, we're talking about seven days. Uh, when they use the word heptad, they could be talking about a week of seven days. Or a heptad could be a um, series of seven months or a heptad could be a series of seven years. Are you with me on that? It'd be like if we used the word week, and we could be talking about seven days or seven years. Uh, that's what the Bible people did. The word heptad does that. Now, the reason that's important, is, and, and it's even, this is kind of the proof text for that, that understanding, which helps us in other Bible passages to understand when the Bible talks about a week, you kind of have to be careful because sometimes it can be a week of seven days. Sometimes they could be talking about a week of seven years. So he says, fulfill her week, Heptad, and we will give thee this also for her. That's that Rachel, serve another week of what? Seven years. And he even says that in the same sentence, he says, which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. Are you with me on that? So we read this, we say, okay, big deal. But it's a huge deal when you get to Daniel chapter nine, because Daniel uses the same verbiage uh, in talking about 77 periods, seven of what? 70 weeks of Daniel, that's what it's called. It's one of the great prophecies of the Bible, the 70 weeks of Daniel. And if you're new to the Bible, uh, this is a great thing to study. It's kind, of, it's kind of in depth. But in Daniel chapter nine, this angel comes and reveals prophecy to Daniel. It's called the 70 weeks that are determined upon Israel. And they're basically 77 year periods, which means there'd be 490 years that are defined there. By the way, do you remember when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey? And he wept, he said, oh, Jerusalem, you should have known in this thy day. How could the Jews have known that this was the day that the Messiah was riding into Jerusalem? Daniel chapter nine, and the 70 weeks. You see, he says, from the Messiah, the prince, um, or from the, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That is Ar Artaxerxes, by the way, uh, the Babylonian guy who said, go and rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Uh, and from that time to the Messiah, the Prince, will be uh, the 69 sevens or 69 weeks, 483 years. And if you do the math on that, it brings you to the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. That's an amazing prophecy. In fact, there's more than 300 prophecies directly about Jesus Christ, the way he would come, where he would be born, how he would be treated, all of those things. It's all talked about in the Bible. So, the, the idea is 70 weeks are determined upon Israel. Those are heptads. Are you with me on that? So tuck that away in your memory because we will come across that term again and you'll have to determine, is this a week of days or is it a week of years? Well, these are a week of, of years described here. He's got seven more years to work for Rachel, 14 in all. Verse 28, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and gave him, Rachel's, his daughter to wife also. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Billah, uh, his handmaid, to her, hand, uh, to, to her maid. And he went in uh, also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with them uh, yet seven other years. Uh, no duh, he loved Rachel more than Leah. That's kind of the sad truth. But, verse 31, and when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her room, but Rachel was barren. This is the Lord. He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up Le Leah's womb. She'll, because she's hated, I'm gonna help her out a little bit. So Leah conceived and bare a son and she called his name Reuben, which means see a son. <laughs> Good eye. There's a baby here. 
Uh, by the way, the sea of sun, Ruben, Ruben, just wondering if she's rubbing it into uh, Rachel. It's like, Rachel, check out my baby. What's his name? See, a son, which you don't have. <laughs> just, just thinking. Well, <laughs> for she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Behold, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she named his name, uh, called his name Simeon, which means hearing. So the Lord hears. That's good. Verse 34, and she conceived now again and bore a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi, which means joined. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she uh, said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she, uh, she called the name Judah and left bearing for now. Uh, now, <laughs> I put the for now here because we're gonna, now don't pack it up. Uh, let's, I'm not going to do all of this next chapter, but it's kind of going along with the theme here. Let's keep going. So when Rachel, verse one, saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. Paul says, those of you that are married will have trouble. <laughs> Just let this know. Jacob saw this beautiful Rachel. She was out there with her sheep, you know, and everything was all romantic and he kissed her. Now he's got kids running around from Leah who makes your eyes hurt. And now his beautiful wife's coming up saying, you better give me kids or I'm gonna die. Welcome to marriage. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that Paul makes it right. Marriage can be challenging, but it's also good and it's a blessing. But here, Jacob's got his hands full. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree? Now, be careful what you say. She says, give me children or else I die. You know what's gonna be interesting? She will have children, you know that. But how will she die? Does anybody remember? Childbirth. In childbirth. That's kind of an interesting thing. Out of the mouth, we speak words of life and death. Uh, I don't know. I think we have to be careful what we say. Well, verse two, Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from uh, thee the fruit of the womb? I, I'm not the one who's the problem here. <laughs> God's done this. Verse three, and she said, behold, my maid Bilhah, go in unto her and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. Does this sound like a good idea? Well, she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went unto her. So man, we got Leah now with uh, kids, Bilhah with kids, um, and uh, Rachel, verse six, said, God, God hath judged me and hath also heard my voice and hath given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. That means judging. So Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali, uh, which means my wrestling. See, these names telling the story a little bit here. And so... Uh, when Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob. Man, Jacob's busy. Um, and so Zilpah, verse 10, Leah's maid bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, a troop cometh, I guess. And so she called his name Gadzooks. Um, no, just, I'm sorry, I should have said it. Called, called her name Gad, his, his name Gad. And so Zilpah, verse 12, Leah's maid bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher, which means happy. Do um, you see what's going on here? Uh, there's a child battle between Rachel and Leah. And apparently the handmaids count as their own kids. And so they're just starting to stack up all these kids. Jacob's stacking his kids like logs now. It's crazy, kids everywhere. Well, verse Verse 14, Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest. Now, Reuben's getting to be older, firstborn. And uh, it says, he found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, give me, I pray thee, thy, of thy son's mandrakes. Now, remember, Leah and Rachel are kind of fighting. Uh, do you think Leah's gonna give her the mandrakes? Well, uh, verse 15, she said unto her, it is a small matter that thou hast taken my husband. And what hast thou taken away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. And Jacob came out in the, from the field in the evening and Leah went out to meet him and said, thou must come in unto me for surely I've hired thee with thy son's mandrakes. And so he laid with her that night. 
Uh, does anybody get a little bit creeped out by this whole thing? <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. Okay, you're saying, what is the deal? I'm, this, this is where the Bible just leaves me in the dust. Uh, what's up with this story? Well, it's kind of interesting. Mandrakes, what's a mandrake? Well, we don't have them here. If you look up the Hebrew word uh, for mandrake or the description of what a mandrake is, it's kind of like this groovy little term. Gro gro groovy little term, Brett? Yeah, it's called the love apple. It's like a fruit that's about love. And they had sort of this, uh, this what, what do they call it? Not a, you know, where you think something's magical. Suspicious, uh, what? Superstition, thank you. That, just drawing a blank. Superstition that these little love apples would make you fertile and you'd have children. So Reuben finds mandrakes. That's why Rachel wants them. Oh, he's got mandrakes? Okay, Leah, you can sleep with Jacob tonight. If, if you'll sell me, I'll sell, you can have a night. Apparently, Rachel was kind of in control of who got to spend the night with Jacob. So she sells the night to Leah for the mandrakes, the love apples. Isn't that a weird deal? <laughs> Sounds like something out of the 60s. <laughs> well, anyway... So she goes, uh, now what happens? Does this help Rachel's plight? Well, Leah gets pregnant again. So uh, God, um, it says in verse 17, God hearkened unto Leah and she conceived and bare Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire because I have him had uh, given my maiden to my husband and, he is, and she has call, called his name Issachar, which means a hire. Boy, I'd be embarrassed if I was Issachar and I knew this story. Yeah, basically mom paid so I could come about um, with some mandrakes. Verse 19, and Leah conceived again and bare Jacob a sixth son. Leah's winning. If you're doing a chalk tally on the chalkboard, uh, she's got six sons now. And Leah says, verse 20, uh, God hath endued with me a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun, which means dwelling. And after that, afterwards, she bare a daughter and called her name Dinah, which means judgment. <laughs> now, um, interesting. Uh, so she's stacking up the kids. Uh, the mandrake thing sort of backfired on Rachel, but the whole thing's kind of a mess, really. What's amazing to me is the Lord, as you know, if you're a Bible student, you know these kids that are stacking up become the 12 tribes of Israel. Not without their flaws, but it's a nation that's being brought about and God's gonna bless these guys. It's an amazing thing that God can take our tweaked out, mandrake buying uh, works and the Lord can still bless and cover. That's, that's the Lord we serve. Um, so now she's got Dinah, uh, and that's seven kids from, uh, from Leah. Well, poor Rachel, she still hasn't had a child. She's still barren, but now verse 22, God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her womb and she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Um, added, that's what Joseph means or adding. God has added and will add more and, and he will uh, for Rachel will give birth to Benjamin uh, and Jacob will favor Joseph and Benjamin. Again, parents favoring their children, not a good, good idea. It's not gonna work out very well because of the favoritism. But what we see here is um, Jacob ends up being tricked by Uncle Laban. He ends up being tricked by his own wives, really. If you ask me this battle between um, Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah and the whole thing just kind of seems brutal. And uh, let me just read you again, J uh, Galatians chapter six, verse seven. It says this, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall reap of the spirit life everlasting. So let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This idea of sowing and reaping, examples are all throughout the scriptures. Do you remember when Pharaoh slew the children of, of, of uh, Israel, the men, the, uh, the boys, child of, the, of, of Egypt, they were all slain. Do you remember what happened to his own son? He was ended up slain. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Ahab brought false accusations to Naboth and, um, and Naboth ended up being killed 
and, uh, and God sent a- uh, Elijah to Ahab and said, you will be killed and the dogs will lick up your blood like Naboth's blood was licked up by the dogs. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Uh, there's other stories. David found that, uh, um, that applied to his own life, this whole sowing and reaping where he committed sins of adultery. Remember that? And murder. But be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that will he also reap. So his life ends up being really in real trouble. Um, in fact, he reaped what he had sown. Even his own daughter was raped and his son was slain and, and Absalom rebelled and he had trouble in his house. Whatsoever man sows. Paul the apostle, when he'd given consent, remember he, he was ready to let Stephen be stoned to death in Acts chapter seven. And he was a part of the whole thing. Only later, when he became a believer in the city of Lystra, he was stoned and left for dead, Paul himself. So uh, even with the believers in the Bible, you see them, whatever man sows, that's what he's gonna reap. Jacob is in the midst of that uh, truth and he's learning what that means. Let me just end tonight with this. Be careful what you're sowing. Whatever you sow, that's what you're gonna reap. Now, there's, um, there's good seed and there's bad seed. Bad seed is doing mean things to people, treating people badly, you know, ripping people off, tricking people, uh, speaking mean words. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. The Bible says that. But don't forget the context of Galatians. It also says, but if you reap good stuff, you're going to reap good stuff. Good seed reap, uh, will bring about good fruit. So what kind of sowing are you doing with your life? Have you been sowing good seed that's full of mercy and kindness, generosity, big heartedness? Or are you sowing seeds of bitterness and anger and you're unforgiving toward people and people that have wronged you, you get them back or you get mad or you're still ticked off? That, what are you doing? That's external stuff. What about internal stuff? Whatever you sow internally, are you sowing bad stuff in your, in your heart, in your soul? The Bible calls it your soul. The world calls it your psyche. What kind of seeds do you sow? It's kind of an interesting thing to think about, but I believe that whatever you're filling your mind with, uh, there's, there's a sowing and reaping that goes on. People say, I'm depressed. What are you sowing your, your life full of? Are you sowing good seed? You know, it's funny, Jesus called the, the word of God seed. And I think what you're doing tonight by being here on a Wednesday night, a lot of people at home watching Survivor tonight or doing whatever they wanna do, that's, that's fine. But I think you're gonna sow seed tonight because it's the word of God going in your soul. And that's why people come to Wednesday night, I think, is there's good seed being sown and there's gonna be good fruit seen in your life because of it. What kind of music are you listening to? I'm not talking about a type of music. I don't care if it's headbanger or country, although I can't see how a person could be saved and do country. I'm just kidding, just, just a joke. No, uh, country music, jazz, whatever kind of music. I'm not talking, but is it music that feeds your soul good seed? Good, good stuff, or is it sowing anger and depression and sinful stuff and sex and stuff like that? What are you sowing in your heart? Because that's that seed's going to come to bear fruit, good fruit or bad fruit. I'm so thankful I grew up in a house, honestly, where my parents uh, took that to heart. So we read the word together. We had family devotions in the Bible. Um, when I got home from school, my mom would have Christian praise music going in the house. Um, and it, our just house, I was full of just Jesus. And it, it, it just smelled like Jesus. And it was like a joy to, to come home from school. Um, and so because of that going into my soul, I, I remember just being kind of a happy kid, I think. I wonder if mom and dad, you're helping your kids sow a uh, seed that's gonna bring forth good fruit. Whatsoever a man or woman sows, that will he also reap. Jacob sowed some pretty bad seed already and he's seeing some pretty bad fruit. Now, that's the bad news. The good news, God can still help the tweaked out person. Maybe you've sowed piles of bad seed in your life. Don't be depressed. The Lord can fix that. That's his specialty. That's what he's good at. And we're gonna see that ultimately happen with Jacob too. So next week, we'll finish up, what is it? Chapter 30 and uh, move on in our study. Let's pray together. And Lord, tonight we see that biblical rule coming to pass, that whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. And tonight, Lord, we really want to be those who sow to reap a good harvest of good fruit. Show us areas, Lord, where we can do better. 
Um, I pray that your word would be sown in our hearts and bring forth good seed, good fruit. And Lord, that, um, that the bad stuff we'd just avoid and, and run away from. We do know, Lord, that marriage can be trying, but I pray for the marriages in this church that you'd strengthen them and that there'd be real joy and none of this trickery or weirdness going on in this story. I pray that there would be just a, a love and a like-mindedness within the marriages here at Athey Creek where husbands and wives would be that picture of how much you love us. Father, I pray your blessing on these, your people, as they've carved out this time to study your word. May it just be a blessing to them. And as we go our way, Lord, we rejoice in your word and in your work. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.